So that might be a little bit small. <laughs> um, but we're actually sort of seeing, you know, these, these functions sort of get state, get lens, this kind of thing are actually sort of saying, right, they are Im implying that, you know, you're passing this state in uh, and, you know, this, this kind of stuff. So if we look at this get lens partial, uh, what we're actually saying is, you know, it takes this, uh, this, this function, this, this lens, uh, and then applies it to the state that we've got from this get state kind of thing. Um, it's not the clearest thing, and this is not the simplest computation expression under the hood. But basically, if, if you assume that sort of computation expressions have some sort of context or have something going on extra behind the scenes, uh, so either sort of making something async or threading some sort of state through, um, that's a reasonable assumption for now. They're, they're probably enough, you know, computation expressions and how they work and why is probably a good two hour talk, but it's, um, but they're, it's sort of, you, you can use them and, and sort of expect what they do. They, they're all going to obey some rules. So. Well, and another like, way more uh, like Adobe's question. In the uh, like main method, you're doing console logging and like the exercise that start. Yeah. Can you bind that to uh, where underscore equals this thing? Yeah. I've also seen using the ignore function. Yeah. Is that just a stylistic choice? Or yes. It, it, it absolutely is. So let underscore uh, is pretty much identical to saying, you know, console.read line pipe to ignore. Yeah. Um, in, in this case, it purely is a stylistic thing. Um, honestly, it's actually sad enough that I just like lining the underscores up. So <laughs> it's, uh, I, I have a kind of, I have really, really specific kind of, yeah. You, you will notice that if, if you ever dive through the core of something like Freya, and there's a lot of it, but if you ever do, You'll, you'll find that it, it has a, an almost worrying attention to things like that. So, yeah, my apologies for that. You could do that other ways. So. Cool. Okay, let's see if we can get back to uh, extending. Yeah, of course you have. Okay, so the, the, the first half of this might have been sort of, uh, we've got everyone back or we're missing? Oh, wait. <laughs> Nearly everyone back. There's always one. This is neither here nor there. Yeah. Well, actually here, but <laughs> more here than there. But how would you characterize the commercial interest in F sharp as of today? Like what, what sort of organizations would want one to get? Uh, wow, yeah. That's just, just a, a small minor question. Um, it's intentionally yeah. open-ended. Yeah. Uh, I guess what we've got a sec. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like a lot of functional programming languages. I mean, I, uh, people for years have been making these kind of arguments that it's really great for maths, or it's really great for scientific <coughs> computing, or it's really great for X. I'm not actually a big fan of that kind of argument. I think that actually functional programming done well is, is good for anything. Um, F sharp in particular, um, honestly, I would say that sort of it, it's probably quite good for anywhere that you're currently using .NET, uh, purely because there are some things which it might not be great for uh, in, in some senses. Sort of there are some, but that's mainly to do with the kind of API you're using. Um, so if you want to write really idiosyncratic F sharp, and you're using an API which relies heavily on kind of pointers and mutation and low level access and all the rest of it, are you going to get a great deal out of it? I don't know. You might not. Um, so if you're sort of doing things like uh, sort of really low level sort of direct X access or something else, I don't know whether it's going to be a great deal better than, than C sharp. It's probably going to look a lot like it, really, where you're just sort of modifying pointers to something crazy in memory somewhere. Um, but it, I would say it's an extra sort of general purpose language. I mean, it's. I'm, I'm not sure there's a, a yes or no as to when, to when you'd use it. Most of the people or sort of companies I've known that have had any objections to using it is mainly around people. Uh, and, you know, people have got to learn it. Um, I'm not a massive fan of companies that sort of want to stop people learning things. And sort of I've always had this sort of problem with people saying, you know, oh, we, what, what are we going to do? Because all our staff would have to learn this thing. It's like, that doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world. But it's... That's going to be a problem regardless. <laughs> 
Yeah. Or else you'd still be using DB. Well, exactly, right? You know, it's sort of anyone that sort of comes up with that example to say, you know, we, we don't want to train our staff, we don't want to grow them. It's like, okay, but I don't know I can really help you in a general sense then, because that's just not a good plan. So um, I, I think the barriers to, to sort of adopting f -sharp in most organizations are probably a lot smaller than people really, really think. Um, they're usually much more about sort of politics and control and sort of perceived issues with hiring and this kind of thing, which actually, if you look at things differently, kind of go away. Um, I, I would have said, for example, at the moment, that sort of people's ideas around, you know, we, we couldn't hire F-sharp developers. Um, a, you probably could, because loads of people would actually like to get paid to do it. And B, a load of people that are currently not doing F-sharp would probably quite like to learn if you actually asked them. So, I don't know. Um, Scala compiler could compile Java code easily. Yeah. So you could move all your code into the like Scala folder and yeah. start and start modifying it gradually. You can yeah. you can do this with uh, C sharp and F sharp. Oh totally. I mean it, it's definitely a world where, you know, provided you're at least slightly sensible about what you expose from your F sharp code, you know, interop between C sharp and F sharp can work perfectly well. Mm -hmm. um, well you know, you don't the syntax is yeah. so different. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, I've definitely seen it work well where people have, you know, sort of had mixed code bases and, and transitioned over time, or sort of written, said, okay, we're going to write sort of this part of our code base, this kind of nasty sort of grungy bit over here in C sharp because it's really good for it. We're going to write domain logic over here in F sharp because it's really expressive. Yeah, it depends what works for people really. All right. So the second part of this, and I'm sort of conscious we've got so about 50 minutes. We'll see how far we can get. Um, introduces kind of the next level of abstraction up in, in Freya, which is uh, Freya Machine. Um, there isn't really, other than Freya, as far as I'm aware, an equivalent to this in the .NET world, but there definitely is in the Erlang world with Web Machine, which is kind of really a sort of the, the front runner of this, probably one of the earliest implementations. I would say probably the earliest implementation of this style of, of web programming. Um, Clojure has its own kind of world too. The Liberator framework, I suspect there are probably others in other places. There are others in Haskell. Uh, there is a framework called Lemachine in Haskell, which takes this insanely far and actually tries to make sure that all of these are actually provable assertions. Uh, they've got as far as modeling all of HTTP 1.0. They haven't managed to prove 1.1 yet, but good luck to them. Uh, having written all the parses for HTTP 1.1, they're going to be there a while. Um, so the, the machine style framework essentially says, right, we're going to stop. Uh, Sort of actually, sort of imperatively, sort of writing our our responses to requests. We're going to stop sort of saying, "Okay, right, I've got this in. Is it this? All right, I'm going to write this header. I'm going to do this thing. Uh, you know, oh, someone's asked for this. Does that exist? I'll go and find it. All right, I, I couldn't find it. I'm going to send a 404 back. I'm going to have a lot of branching logic. And it says, <coughs> "Okay, can we actually write this as essentially a state machine under the hood? So someone else provides the state machine, which represents an HTTP request." Uh, and you essentially provide information about the resource that you've got. So we can actually sort of say, right, we're going to provide some, some answers to questions uh, about what's actually happening. So I can say, all right, does my resource exist? Here's a function which will tell you whether my resource exists or not. It returns true or false. Here's a function which tells you uh, whether my resource has been modified since this particular time or date. It returns true or false. Uh, so we can just provide some functions which are decisions. Uh, we can also provide potentially some configuration to say, you know, this, this resource, you can have it in JSON, you can have it in XML. Um, but I'm not actually going to tell you how that happens. I'm just going to tell you what can happen. I'm going to describe my resource rather than programming it. Uh, and underneath that, what's going to happen is we're going to run uh, essentially a state machine, which we sort of represent as a graph. Um, and that graph at each node of that kind of graph, it's, depending on where it is, it's going to run a specific function which you might have provided. If you didn't provide it, it's going to use some default value. So it assumes that a, function, a resource exists, for example, if you don't give it a function which says yes or no. Um, and it's going to do all of that sort of underlying logic for sort of, you know, all right, the, the response processing for HTTP. Uh, and actually valid HTTP and going through all that things like content negotiation. Um, you know, sort of working out whether the uh, resource is kind of valid, whether it has e-tags and all this kind of stuff, whether the resource has changed. 
it's going to handle all that stuff just by asking you a few questions about your results, which you may or may not choose to answer. You'll be unsurprised to learn that we have another computation expression. I'm very, very sorry for that. Uh, we have the Freya machine expression, and this is kind of one of the, the larger sort of bits of code in Freya. Um, Freya machine gives you quite a lot of ways to uh, sort of extend and configure what it's doing. Um, it does actually go a little bit further than things like Web Machine and Liberator in terms of giving you uh, sort of, I'm going to go with unprecedented and possibly unwanted power. Um, you, you don't actually need to use all of it, so you can, you can definitely ignore quite a bit if you actually just want to do HTTP. Um, but you can do some crazy things with it if you particularly want to. So we're going to build that to do back end. Um, We've got a sort of 12-step kind of thing in here. We've already got now about three minutes per step. So what we'll probably do is skip over a few things. Uh, feel free to kind of follow along. I think expecting people to actually kind of start typing stuff out and doing things at this point, more exercises, is probably pushing it a bit much. But sort of follow through the, uh, the stages as we go, and that might be kind of sensible. I'm going to drop out the slides in a second. Um, you might want to sort of wander into the sort of project part of that solution. Uh, find stage one. Uh, they were actually, yeah. Uh, you're also going to want to go and find to do backend.com. That URL uh, is probably going to be useful. Um, if you fire up stage one and hit that URL, what it's actually going to do, it's going to run a kind of JavaScript based in browser tests against the, uh, the service that you're pointing it to and say, does it comply with this to do backend spec? Uh, it's not going to comply. We're going to fix that. So I'm going to drop out of the slides for a bit, uh, dive into Visual Studio and the browser, and hope that things work well. So right. First things first, that's not working, is it? Oh, it is. Wow, that's, that's almost miraculous. OK. First things first, we've got uh, a little domain model in the back end, uh, which is our to-do list. Um, to-do back end just expects us to have a few things. It expects us to be able to create new to-dos, which have a sort of a title and an order and whether you've done it or not, that kind of thing. Um, and it expects to be able to sort of create new ones and modify existing ones and delete them and get a list of them and that kind of thing. It's exactly what you'd expect from a really naughty to-do list. Um, so we've created. Uh, a little domain model for that in the back end. Um, if you remember, I talked about a JSON computation expression. We've got that here. Um, I'm not going to go into this library for now. Suffice to say that these to do, to do create, and all the rest of it types are sort of, you know, where we can see that this is from JSON. You can sort of take JSON and get a to do update. You can take JSON, get a to do create. You can turn a to do into some JSON. Um, the mechanics of that we'll gloss over for now. Um, if anyone wants to talk about that later, feel free. And then we actually have basically a little to-do store. Um, again, we'll kind of gloss over a little bit about what this is doing. Uh, but basically, it's going to expose an API, which gives us a bunch of async functions uh, that will take these, uh, these types that we've got and, uh, and do something relatively sane with them. So this is the API which you're actually going to care about uh, exposing sort of via our, our API. So we're going to want to have an HTTP API which essentially maps to this in some way. Hopefully that bit's relatively clear. Uh, all right. We'll forget our domain for a little bit. We'll go take a look at stage one. We'll set this as a startup project. And we'll see what we've got in there. Um, so. First thing to note is we've got a to-do store. We've got a little instance of that up here. Um, it is just a, you know, basically a static instance. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about uh, you know, nice kind of dependency inversion or anything else or anything at this point. Uh, this is a noddy example. Uh, we have a Freya machine, uh, which does nothing right now. Uh, and we're also going to have our to-do backend, which is a router. Uh, which has one resource in it. You'll notice that that's not a root anymore. Uh, if we're using a uh, Freya machine and we open up Freya machine router, we get some extensions to the syntax of that Freya router. Uh, basically, a resource is a root which responds to all methods. 
it is literally shorthand for that. It's just neater. And what we've said is, so we've got our to do's function, uh, which is a frame machine. That's going to represent a resource. And we're going to turn that into a pipeline. And we're going to mount that at the URI slash, just the root URI. Now we're going to fire that up. And then we're going to hit it with to do backend. And it's going to moan at us. And it does. And it's going to moan at us because there's no cause support. Anyone that's had fun working with ASP.NET Web API will, will know this one. If you want core support, and it's wandering off into web.config and doing horrible things and adding core support in and, and this kind of stuff. Core support for those that aren't aware of cores is basically sort of our browser wants to know that it's allowed to make a request to a different domain, cross origin, all this kind of stuff. It's a pain. You need to support it in HTTP. Um, we can do that in Freya. So the first thing we're going to do is add in our cores support. That's going to look like this. So to support cores, we need to tell Freya which headers we're going to let people use from a cross-origin request. We're going to let people need to tell it which origins to allow a request to come from. In this case, we're going to allow it from any. These types, incidentally, are all the strongly typed RFC standards. So we actually have sort of strongly typed representations of all the RFCs around HTTP and the W3 cores specs. And we're also going to need to let it know which methods we're going to accept, uh, both for cores and for this resource in general. One of the other things we're also going to need to do is say that we're going to use cores in this resource. Um, so these using statements are a little bit interesting. So the frame machine, and this is one of the places where we, we differ a little bit from uh, web machine. So what we have in the Freya world, as I said, we, we work with this kind of thing as a decision graph. Uh, so we, we represent that response to HTTP as asking a bunch of questions and, and running a bunch of decisions. Out of the box, the, uh, the Freya decision graph looks a bit like this. Which isn't great. So it's not very HTTP compliant because we've told it to do nothing so far. So we actually, in Freya, we let you define your own graph if you want to do so. We provide an HTTP graph. We provide some extensions to this. And when you actually write your own graph or write your own extension to a graph, what you're actually going to do is you're going to go in and say, OK, add a node, connect it to this, uh, or remove this edge and reconnect it over here. Um, so where we can see that we've got using HTTP, what that's done is added a load of nodes into my default graph. If I didn't have using HTTP or using cores, it would literally do that. Uh, we would start the request, we would end the request, and we would get a blank request back. Because I said it's using HTTP, when this Freya machine gets compiled, or when it gets turned into a pipeline, it's going to go through, and it's going to modify that graph. It's going to add all the nodes in which represent HTTP, uh, and then it's going to compile it. It's going to turn it into a graph that it can execute. But if I want cores support, I also want to use HTTP cores. And what that does is it says, OK, I expect to be run after someone has uh, added HTTP support to the graph. So I have a dependency on HTTP. Uh, and I'm going to remove a few edges from the HTTP graph, and I'm going to put some more nodes and edges in there to handle the logic for cores. So if you wanted to do things like supporting WebSockets or supporting WebDAV or other bits and pieces, what you could actually do is you could write those as a graph extension. So you could actually say, OK, right, there are some new decisions that need to go in here. I want to extend this in a different way. If you wanted to say, actually, we never do content negotiation. I don't care about that anymore as an optimization, I never want to even try and run this. You could run you something which actually removed content negotiation from the graph. So you just completely skip that step, and you never run it, and it's quicker now. So it's kind of useful. It's definitely a power feature. It's definitely something which you don't want to be using much of the time. And HTTP and HTTP cores will get you 99 point, at least an Erlang like five nines level of what you want. Um, but if you do need to do something. 
Uh, well, yeah, I, I've built things with, with nine fives, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Um, so by doing this and adding HTTP and HTTP cores, we've now got our graph which supports HTTP and it supports the right things for cores too. It's going to look for those cores headers in the request and it's going to ask the right questions about us when we, uh, when we process it. Uh, so we need to tell it which headers we support for cores, which methods we support, which origins we support. We've done that here. Uh, you'll notice there's a lot of custom grammar in this. Uh, so this computation expression actually has a lot of custom keywords. We actually do things very declaratively. This is just about defining what our resource is. We also say that this, uh, this to-do's resource supports uh, get and options to start with as well. Um, that's actually the default, I think. Or it might be get and head, I think. If you, if you don't tell it which methods it'll support, it'll assume you just want to get resource. Um, but we might as well be explicit about it here. That's kind of handy. So hopefully now, if we run stage two, we might see, and feel free to follow along in your code or run things if you wish, we might see that we get, perhaps, if we're lucky, different errors. Yeah, we did. OK, so it tried to get it. Cause headers are cool. Um, but if you can read those errors up there, which you probably can't. Can I make this any bigger? can a little. If you can read those errors, it's going to say, OK, right, well, we, we made that request, but we got a 406 back. We, we kind of, you know, it wasn't acceptable. Well, that's because it's expecting JSON. It's expecting that, uh, you know, it's going to say, you know, I, I want to get JSON back from this. And we haven't told our resource that actually, you know, you can respond with JSON. In fact, we haven't told it anything. And by default, it assumes that you can't respond with anything or it's just plain text. So if we want to actually tell it, yeah, you can deal with that. That's OK. We do something very similar. We'll go ahead and we'll add something in. So we will say that the to-do's media types supported uh, are over here. And we will say that we support JSON. And we'll go ahead and add that into our to-do's machine down here. So we can say, all right, so now it's going to support JSON. So we should, that's actually going to handle all of the content negotiation that we might need. So now it, we've told Freya and Freya Machine enough to know that, yeah, OK. Sure. Does order matters? Nope. Order media type supported? No, in this case, so uh, ordering in this doesn't matter at all. Um, so these are literally just declaratively specifying you can group these, order them, however you want to do, however it makes sense in your, uh, you know, in your thing. You, you might find later on that sort of grouping common sort of bits of configuration together is useful, that kind of thing. But order doesn't matter. Yeah. So one of the things that you'll start to note though at this point, and this is another area where we go a little bit further than some implementations of things like uh, sort of machine style frameworks is that you'll notice that these functions uh, are actually Freya functions. So when I'm saying sort of the media type supported, I'm not hard coding this, or at least I'm not setting this at compile time as such. It's actually going to evaluate this function at runtime. So I can actually put logic in there if I want to. All of the configuration and all of these types of things, wherever I'm setting this stuff up, I can actually change the answer to these questions at runtime if I wanted to. You usually won't, again, but sometimes this might be handy. Let's say uh, you've got two versions of your API, or you know, you've know you got a version of your API which has got a, a standard and enterprise version. And you want to say, OK, so the standard version only supports JSON. The enterprise version supports JSON and XML because they're masochists. Um, so OK, that's cool. Um, the media type supported in that case, you might say, right, well, the enterprise version, they're going to come in with a, a specific header. You know, or some sort of bit of authentication or something else which they're going to have set. So you might say in this media type supported, you might say, OK, let's, let's match on that header. If this header exists, we're going to say that the media type supported a JSON and XML. If this header doesn't exist, we're going to say it's just JSON. So actually, not only have you sort of, you know, you've implemented that switch in that logic, but your HTTP responses are now going to be correct based on the caller. So when someone does something like options or they do a head request or anything else, the content negotiation is going to be right. You don't need to hard code this. You can actually do all of these things dynamically. Uh, the same, even the same with saying what methods you support. 
these are all dynamics. You can say, okay, for the enterprise clients, we actually, or you know, for these clients, we let you modify this request. We use support post for these people, but not for these. It's almost impossible to do anything like that with something like Web API, which is kind of fun. Uh, you can even do things like saying, okay, right, so we will support. Obviously, we're doing this on a per resource basis too at the moment. So you can say, right, okay, we're only going to support calls on these particular URIs of these types of resources for this person. There's no way you can do that with anything like Web API or anything else. But <laughs> as I say, it's not something you always need. But if you want to be really accurate and precise and actually define an API which you're completely in control of, this is the way to do it, unless you want to go very low level. All right. So hopefully, we've now told it that it can deal with JSON. So let's see what it's going to uh, find now. Let's see in which particularly exciting way it crashes and burns at this particular point. So we've failed before. Are we going to fail in the same way? Ah, we actually did respond to a get. We passed our first test, which is always a nice moment. Cause header <coughs> sets up. It could deal with JSON. The content negotiation works. It was great. Uh, it didn't respond to a post. And in fact, it said, no, it failed cause again. Uh, it just didn't get there. And indeed, it probably actually tried to send an option request, and it would have wanted to get back post. But we haven't told it that it can support post. Let's take a look at stage four. All right. Stage four. Well, we've taken an opportunity to do something a little bit different in this step because we were starting to get uh, you know, quite a lot of things in our one resource. And we know that actually they're going to be common for all of the resources we have. Everything we do here is going to support JSON. It's all going to use HTTP. It's all going to use cores. Uh, we're going to support the same uh, origins and, and media types and headers uh, across all of our resources. So we pull those out into uh, this common frame machine here. So we're going to reuse that. And we're going to say, right now, our to-dos, uh, we just include common. And we can do that as much as we want. So if we have something, for example, so we have some specific sets of authentication logic or security that we want applied to all of our resources, we can pull those out into a common machine definition and just include those in the resources where it applies. If we wanted to be a little bit cleverer than that, we could say, OK, we're always going to have a security uh, sort of module or a security function, which we can call. But maybe we want that to be parameterized. Well, we can do that too. We could actually say, right, OK, this, this comma takes a parameter, and then we include it with a parameter in different resources. You could say, you know, the security model takes a high or low, uh, and it will have logic in there which will, which will look for that kind of thing. It's all composable. We can build it all down into small little chunks and reuse them. But for now, we've just pulled out kind of the stuff which is going to apply to everything. We've, uh, we've got our HTTP and cause graphs, and we've got our cause headers and our media types. We've renamed them a little bit just so that we know they're common. Um, we've sort of pulled them out a little just so we can uh, start to distinguish between the things which are resource specific and the things which are not. So the methods are going to be resource specific. We've left them there. Uh, and so our to do's resource now just looks like uh, this common to do's methods, et cetera, et cetera, because those are the only things that apply to only this resource. You'll notice that we haven't actually changed this yet. We'll do that now in stage five. So I'm going to set that as the startup project. We'll come back in there. We find we've got the same stuff. And we support post now. If we're going to support post, though, we're actually going to need to do something with that data as it comes in. Um, and again, that's about supplying the kind of function which our resource might need to handle a post. So in this case, we will say we need to implement do post in our machine. And we're going to give that a function, which is just another Freya function. In this case, it can just be a Freya function of unit. We don't expect this to actually return anything. Um, we just want to know that when we actually have a post request comes in, we need to run this function. So this is going to get a little bit more involved just for a moment. We'll see what that looks like. This bit, you're going to need to take a little bit on faith. So we've got the request body coming in, which is going to have a new to-do to be created. 
Um, so we're going to have a function, a Freya function, which actually reads this. And we say, OK, well, I want to get the request body. Uh, and then I want to read that request body into uh, this, this string of data. So hopefully what I'm going to get in at this point is a big JSON string. Uh, and then I'm going to use my JSON library to try and turn that into an actual object of some type. Now, what you'll notice from this is A, it's in line, and B, I'm not specifying what type of object this is actually going to return, because I don't know. This, this function is actually going to use static type inference to work it out. So later on, wherever I ask for read, it's going to try and infer what read should return based on what I'm about to do with it. So we're going to use the F-sharp type inference uh, to actually make this, this multipurpose read function, which can just give me a type of T, or A, or whatever we want to call it, depending on how Haskell we're feeling, um, based on my need at that time. Actually, it's going to return an A option, because I don't know that I can convert it from JSON, but it's hopefully we're going to get one. So I'm going to create this function called todos add. Uh, and I know that what I'm actually going to want to call is that to-do store function to add a new to-do. That's what my post is going to be. Um, so I'm going to need to create, I'm going to need a to-do create type or a to-do create instance at that point because I want to pass it to to-do store.add. And I can just call read because the type inference is actually going to say, yeah, okay, you need a to-do create here because you're passing it to this. Uh, and I'm going to use this Freya from async function, which is, if you're in a sort of more uh, Haskell world, is essentially lift. This essentially takes an async function and means that we can call it from Freya. So I'm going to create, so Freya from async to do store add with my to do create, which came in as the body. So this read function reads the body of a, a request and turns it into whatever I need, hopefully. And that might seem kind of unpleasant, but the useful thing to note about that is that you only need these once per sort of, well, app, really. You know, this, this is really generic reusable code. You could actually probably do the same thing to XML if you probably, if you needed to do so. Um, this is going to basically say, right, okay, wherever I want to read the body, just do it for me. So we'll note that we've got this function down here. So this is going to take our to do create from the body. It's going to add it to the to do store. And what does that actually return? Well, that uh, to do store function returns a to do, uh, which is going to be useful. So we've got our to do's add do. And actually, I've just called this function here because in my do post function, I don't actually care about the result. Uh, I just need that to be unit. I'm not going to care what that looks like. So I do to do's add. I throw the result away, and I return unit. And that's what I call in my machine. So we'll see what happens. Ah, oh, I still failed. Well, I, it's happily I expected to. But the reason I failed is different now. So oh yeah, I support post, and it did a post, but it didn't get the to do back, which was passed to it. In this case, to do back end actually wants us to respond to a post with the to do item we just created, which is a bit weird. But you know, it's but it's fine. We can deal with that. What we'll do is we'll say, yeah, that's fine. I've handled the actual posting, but now I need to handle what the response looks like when I've created a new object. So still got my to-do add, still got my to-dos add do. Uh, now I've got my to-dos add handle. And down here, I've said, right, OK, so handle created. So this is going to get called when I've created a new object, so a 204 or something like that. Some of my graphs, this is going to get called when everything's happened and I need to actually send a response. All of these functions like handle something are all about sending a response back to the client. Our default one, which we'll see in a moment, is just handle OK. If we just get a 200, if you just do a get, handle OK will tell you what you're actually going to send back. 
All right, so to do that handle, it's a little bit more complicated again. It's the last bit of a little bit more complicated, I promise. Um, in this case, I actually do care about sending that to do back again. Uh, but I know that uh, my to-do's add function actually gives me the to-do I want. So I'll just go and grab that to-do from the to-do's add function up here and write it back to the, to the client. I'll write it back to the body. Two things about this. One write is kind of interesting, and it's very much like our read earlier. It'll take any object, and it'll write it back to the body. And it will actually write it back, and it'll say it's UTF-8 and it's JSON, and it's in English, and this kind of stuff. I'll come back to that a little bit later, because that's about how you respond to content negotiation. In this particular case, it's not a big deal, because we only support JSON. We're not really doing any negotiation. I can hard code this. But I'll just mention a little bit later about what's happening. We're actually supporting more. The eagle-eyed and eagle-brained, however, will obviously have noted that I've called to do that twice in this approach. And that's probably not really what I want. So. I've handled that post and I've added a to-do. Uh, and then here, I'm, I'm running it again to get my to-do back again. Um, so I'm actually going to have added this to-do twice if I'm not careful. And that's, well, that's rubbish. So we have this little chunk on the end here called Freya.memo. Freya.memo is literally a memoization function which will take any Freya function and will make sure that you only run it at most once per request. So it'll memorize the, the result of that function and bung it into the environment state. So whenever you call it more than once, it'll say, have I already got this? Yes, I have. I'm not going to run it again and give it back to me. So now I can just say, right, OK, I'm going to create this to-do's add function. And it's safe. You know, It's going to call add to this to-do once. It's going to return this to-do once. So now wherever I care about what the result of that was, I can just call it as many times as I like. But I know that's, that's, that's cool now. I can, I can deal with that. So I call this in two places, but I run it once. And also, I can be sure that the ordering doesn't matter, because I need to do this somewhere. And even if someone changes the order of my graph, well, it's not a problem. If someone calls handle created before they call do post, well, the same result is going to happen. It's item poem. So hopefully, stage six should give us, yeah, you posted something, and you got us to do back. Let's see. Fantastic. So I'm handling my get. I'm handling my post. It's all working well. I'm not deleting it. That's not brilliant. We can probably all guess what's going to come now. I need to handle a few more methods. Simple as this. Simple as saying, right, I'm going to handle, uh, I'm going to add delete to the methods I support on this resource. And I'm going to add a do delete which is the function which I want to call when someone actually uh, sends a delete verb up to this resource. And for that, I'm going to want to call the clear function on my to-do store. So this is actually the root of this API. So this is delete the whole collection of to-dos, not a single to-do. Um, so I'm going to want to clear my to-do store. And again, I only really want this to happen once per request, so I'm going to just memoize that function. And then I'm going to have my to-do's clear do function, which takes the result of that, which is actually probably a unit anyway, but just for, for fun here and just to make sure it's really clear. I take the result of that, throw it away, return unit. Now I support delete. I hope. Let's see. Yeah. But my get response didn't work. Well, that's fine. I haven't actually implemented my get response. Get responses are simple, though, so we just need to handle the OK case. And this is going to be even simpler than before. So this is actually to-dos list. So this is get me my, my collection of to-dos. I wrap my uh, to-do store.list in my Freya from async. I only ever want to do that once. I handle this thing. I grab my list of to-dos. I write it back, and I do handle OK. So at this point, I'm handling all of the things which I probably need to do on this resource, but we will find out. What is handle OK? So handle OK is just the, the handler function for a get request, basically. So if your get request was successful, 
Uh, so you got all the way through to a 200. You didn't sort of bomb out. It was found. It existed, all this kind of jazz. Um, if you've got things like, if it happens to a 404, you can give it something like handle not found or handle not acceptable. You can override all of those things. By default, though, they will actually do something sensible. They'll return the correct headers. They'll return all of the right negotiation that happened. That 406 not acceptable that we saw earlier on actually did return a proper 406, correct status, correct headers, correct negotiation. You know, here are the things you can actually do. It's just wired in. If I wanted to override that, I could do that by handling handle not acceptable. But I don't care. Generally, most of the time, if I'm just writing an API, which I'm expecting some client to consume, I don't need to make it pretty. This is going to do it for me. So stage eight, where did we get to? Cool. So prerequisites are working. We've got a few more tests for free, which is always nice. So adding a new to-do worked. Uh, our to-dos had a URL. New to-dos weren't completed. This is all great. This is all coming from our domain model. That's all fine. Um, they do have a URL, uh, which is just a GUID. Uh, and it should return a to-do, but it doesn't because I don't have a resource which represents an individual to-do at this point. Let's go create one and wire it up. So I've, I've still got my common stuff. I've still got my to-dos. And now I'm going to write a new, a new little resource called to-do. I'm going to include my common stuff, and it's going to have get and options. Uh, and I'm going to wire it up in this router down here. I'm going to say it's just a slash ID. Cool. So that's probably going to fail right now. I'm not even going to bother running that because we know that we haven't actually implemented anything which it might want to do. And we know from what we were talking about just now that actually if I'm going to need to respond to uh, you know, get to that ID URL, uh, I'm going to need to at least implement handle OK because it's going to expect to get it to do if I hit that URI. So I'll move on to stage 10, and we'll see how that looks. It's going to look very, very similar. OK. There's one interesting bit here, which is actually, funny enough, what you were talking about earlier on, which is that now actually we need something out of the root which isn't just a string. Our API expects us to have a GUID. Um, in this case, we do it quite shamefully. Uh, so we actually just go, right, okay, I'm going to assume this is a GUID. I could be a little bit clever about that. I could actually try and pass this into GUID. I could actually allow for the fact that that might not be a GUID because I haven't enforced that in any way. But maybe we could deal with that later on if we wanted to. For now, I'm just going to go, right, okay, I'm going to assume this is a GUID. It's the ID atom from my root. So this to do ID function is a function which will give me uh, the GUID that I, that I care about. So I'm going to write my to-do get function, and I'm going to memoize it. And it's just going to be, right, here's the ID of the to-do that I want. I'm going to pass this to to-do store.get. And I'm going to go OK. And here's the handler function. I'm going to write that to-do. And I'm going to handle OK with my to-do get handle. And if I run this, we should find that we get exactly what we expect which is that, yeah, it now has a URL, and it returns a to-do, and that's great. And now I fail on patch. All right, that's cool. Let's go and our patch support. We're nearly there. We will find that actually that's just as simple as saying, right, OK, I need to call the update method now on my, uh, my to-do store. This is the first one we're actually combining a little bit of data. So we're saying the ID of the to-do that I care about is that to-do ID, which I'm reusing from earlier. The, uh, the update type that I need to send it is the body. And the, uh, I'm going to call to-do store update, and I'm going to pass it this little tuple of data. And again, I'm going to actually need to handle this patch case, which is what it expects. Yeah. Yep, you're right. We don't need it. Right now, we don't need it. By default, I tend to do this. So if I've got something which is isn't mutating it, something. Isn't it an um, error head? Sorry? Isn't it an error head? Yeah, it is a little bit of overhead. In this case, I could remove that. If I came back to this program and thought, right, OK, I'm going to put this in production. Let's go through and make sure we're not doing anything crazy. I could remove this because we can actually be pretty confident that we only ever call this once. So you, you, you need this memorization only 
Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's one of those sorts of things where you're you're rarely going to go wrong sort of adding it if you don't need it in the sense that you know you, you probably do actually logically only ever want to call this once. Um, the overhead is there; it's not zero. It's pretty small, but it's not zero. Uh, if you get to the point where that's an issue and you can say, okay, actually I've looked through this, I'm never going to call this more than once. Cool. Yeah, go ahead and remove it. Um, you may find uh, that you know if someone comes along later and adds another, you know, handler to this function, then it might have sort of unexpected side effects. But then that's just code and refactoring for you. Um, but yeah, in this case, we don't need it. Okay. Thank you. So I've handled my patch method. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, method I've had to add here is actually a custom method. Patch is not in the HTTP RFCs. It's an extension RFC, which I haven't added the type support for in this project. But I can actually, if I want to support any custom verbs, I can just have you know, a custom, custom method here. So technically, you can implement any language, any verbs. Yeah. Yeah, and the reason that we need to be able to do that is because there are obviously, so if we want to start supporting things like WebDAV or, or any of these kinds of things, or if we want to create our own uh, API vocabulary on top of HTTP, and this is where we get into that sort of really off in the weasel of abstraction. It's often quite valid that you might say, yes, I do actually want to create my own HTTP verb. You know, I have an API where that makes sense. I'm going to create my own verb and I'm going to extend this machine. I'm going to create a new graph extension. I'm going to create a new verb. And here's how I'm going to handle that. And now any of my, my devs or any of the people working on my team, as long as they just use these resources, you know, that now handles our version of HTTP. Yeah, you could do either way. Yeah. Obviously, sort of there are standards which require sort of more verbs than plain HTTP. That's exciting. <laughs> it's because I'm on a different network. Go away. Wow. OK. Are we back? Yes, we are. I promise this isn't a dodgy version of Windows. It's just because it's normally in boot camp, and now it's uh, <laughs> I have an MSDN license, I swear. Um, I wish I didn't, but I do. So we've got this. We've supported patch. Uh, if we fire this up, we should see that that works. Final thing, we can't actually delete a single to do. Uh, we're passing every test but that one. Let's just make sure we support the delete. Stage 12 will be there. OK, so. And the final thing to add was just this, uh, this delete support. And then I added delete support on my to-do store. Let's just make sure we at least pass everything before we start to have more fun things. Yes. Yes, we do. So we've got a complete API. We, we've met that back end. We've met it really accurately. Uh, we've met it with complete control over what we're doing. Um, but you might have noticed there are a few things in there which are potentially a little dangerous. Uh, and you might be tempted to address these in, uh, in specific ways, in more F-sharp ways, but there are ways you can do this with the machine. So let's take an example. So where we've got our to-do here, we don't have anything which says, you know, we, we've assumed that a handle OK actually returns a to-do. If someone sends me something which is a GUID which does not exist as a to-do, what am I going to do at this point? Well, you know, I could go into my to-do get function and sort of do, you know, maybe some kind of kind of match statement on my to-do store.get and this kind of thing. In my to-do handle, I could, you know, try and, well, I could write the headers out manually and send a 404 back or something like that. But I don't really want to do that. And the good thing about this graph approach and about the machine approach is that actually it's just another question that I need to answer about my resource. So the to-do backend doesn't actually mandate, it doesn't run any tests which try to get you know, a non-existent to-do uh, and actually uh, sort of do something sensible with that. It should, probably if you're actually going to write a good test suite, it should probably test and actually get a sensible result back when this fails. At the moment, we get a runtime exception, and that's probably not brilliant. So what we could do is we just need to answer another question about my to-do. So I'm going to add that here. And what I want to know is, does this to-do exist? And again, it's just a question I need to answer. So I need a Freya function which returns a bool. 
Now I know that I've actually got my function which is to do get, which I can run as many times as I like, and it returns a to do option. So I can actually just write a quick new function called something like to do exists. And I could say let my to do equals to do get a return option dot is sum to do. All right. So now I've got that decision function. I can say, yeah, OK, just uh, somewhere in the graph, before you actually go and uh, try and sort of send them this to do, check it exists first. So now if I actually get that, I get 404 support for free now. So wherever I want to do this, in this case, I'm doing this in a way which just uses my actual to do. But if I wanted to write a really large API and I wanted to design for performance, or I was working on a Facebook scale, uh, actually, we probably want to make things like existence checks a lot more optimized than this. We probably don't want to go and get some expensive resource, which is, you know, takes time to go to a DB. We might actually want to say that actually we want to check whether a resource exists just in a local cache. Or we, we have a Redis store of, you know, ID to exist. Uh, and now what I can say is, right, okay, well, I'm going to implement this function over here, which just goes and checks in my existence cache. I might then decide to say that, okay, well, I'm going to do that for every resource I have. Uh, so I'm going to have a read-through cache which says, you know, does this resource exist? Uh, so I might then decide to say, right, okay, well, this existence check uh, is going to go up here. And I'm going to say that that existence check actually is resource exists, some fictional function which I haven't done. And now all of the resources I have have 404 support, properly optimized, et cetera, and I can do that in one place. There's lots more you can do like that, and there's lots more that you can start to say, okay, right, well, we can control a lot more about what we do on a resource by resource basis uh, when I don't need to think about you know, what my framework's doing in a specific way. I only need to answer the questions I care about. There's a lot of questions I can answer. I can answer lots of questions about, you know, if I give this a function which returns an e-tag or something like that, now I get uh, you know, some negotiation around liveness for free. If I give this a function which gives me a last modified date, now I support all of those things, and I'll automatically send the correct headers so that clients never actually you know, request data they've already got. All I need to do is just give it a function which returns a date. When was your thing last modified? Or a function which returns a hash for an e-tag. It's all strongly typed, incidentally. I need to return an e-tag type, but uh, it's there. So that's kind of the very basic machine usage. And you can start building up really complex APIs very easily uh, and start pulling out more and more functions and building these lots of reusable little building blocks that you can create to actually build big complex APIs where it's only writing one piece of code once. There's a couple of little things on our roadmap which also might be fun. Let's see whether I can find them. When I talked earlier about levels of abstraction, machine is obviously a chunk up from just working with Freya and working with the request and response directly. It has a lot of things which are kind of useful. If you want to start supporting things which are actually hypermedia, then you can build a layer of abstraction on top of machine. So you're going to have to forgive the fact that this is in the monadic syntax, not the other one. This is Freya Hal Jason. Let's see how zoomed in we are. If we have a look down the bottom here, we see that we have a resource which is actually defined as a Hal Jason resource. It has state, it has embedded links, it has embedded resources. All of these are strongly typed. We have a type system which embodies HAL JSON. Uh, we can run this at runtime. This actually compiles to a Freya machine. And it compiles to a Freya machine with metadata, so it automatically generates the Swagger documentation for API. So it gets kind of interesting. This is an example of where you can say, right, OK, the right level of abstraction for my company or for my API or for my project that I'm doing is here. And I'm going to work at that level of abstraction. I'm going to build a new one. We have some interesting projects going on to sort of push out new hypermedia standards. We're going to planning on supporting things like JSON-LD, JSON-Hypermedia, some of the new stuff that's coming out. Uh, and you'll be able to do that and just say, OK, yeah, I'm just going to give you just my type. And here are the links, and here's the rels, and here's the URIs, and here's the stuff which actually make up the logic of my API. I don't want to care about how you send it. I don't want to care about how you serialize it. I don't want to care about any of this stuff. I want to describe my API to you in this strongly typed way. And I want you to deal with all of that stuff. 
and it will. This will give you a full JSON, HAL JSON typed resource of proper hypermedia standards just by defining what are the actual parts of this thing. You know, here is an author, it has books and publishers in it. Here is the URIs for those. Here's how you develop a link. We're even doing things like saying, okay, so the, uh, the URI for an author we use within the representation of an author. We use it in here. We also use that, well, okay. We also use that URI, exactly the same thing. We use the URI to wire it up in the router. So now if we actually change the URI for anything in our system, all of the URIs will update and we can automatically get this. So our hypermedia API automatically relinks itself, rehomes itself, everything is now relative to each other and we have a strongly typed way of dealing with that. Version for free too, which is cool. So, back to slides, if I can make projects work very briefly. Okay, we had a worked example. Hopefully it was reasonably clear in terms of how we started to build things up. Um, there's a lot more documentation and interesting things you can do with Freya. It's a lot more powerful uh, than some more traditional approaches to building things. It gives you a lot of extension points and hooks, a lot of fun things to do with it. Uh, I hope you go and play with it. And if you've got any questions, can we give me a shout, either now or after I'll be wandering around. Um, we are bang on, or oh, well, one minute past, never mind, close. We were pretty close to time, so probably not enough to have too much for Q&A, but if people want to hang around afterwards or find me later or lunch or anything else, that would be cool. And thanks for coming along. <laughs>